Welcome to Rates and Barrels, Monday, January 22nd. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you as we continue our position preview series. And in the interest of brevity, not in terms of episode duration, but in terms of episode quantity, today features UT only players and catchers mashed into one episode. I'm excited, you know. <laughs> It's the, it's a, it's a weird grouping. It's a very weird grouping and mashers that run slow. <laughs> that's why I put them together. Yeah. And, if, and it seems like the last few years, we've had a couple of guys who end up in this UT only bucket because they're catchers who came up late in the year, but didn't catch more than they DH'd and they lost their eligibility because of the way the rules work in a lot of leagues. Um, and yet again, it happened and yet again, it's an Oakland a we'll save that player for a bit later in the show. It's also a way to feature Shohei Otani kind of at the top of his own episode. He deserves it. I mean, it's it's just <laughs> it's been a question ever since Otani came over to Major League Baseball. How do we use him? How valuable is he? And every year it seems like you get a slightly different wrinkle because he'll reach a new level skills wise or in one season's past. He's come off of Tommy John surgery. And here we are again this offseason. He's coming off of an elbow procedure, which is still a little more open ended than we'd like. We've seen him come off an arm injury before with the surgery and get back to hitting relatively quickly. But when Otani did that last time, we knew it was Tommy John and the performance as a hitter was not at the level that we've grown accustomed to in recent years, right? This this has been a couple of seasons since this happened. So I'm very curious to know where you stand on Otani in 2024, knowing it's UT only. You're not going to have that optionality to use him as a pitcher because he's not going to pitch this year. And there is always the possibility of a slight delay to the start of his season and that the skills aren't all the way there right away coming off of surgery. Yeah, it's just super annoying. The tack that the uh, that his agent took and the team took and the type the amount of information we've gotten. Everyone reading between the lines is pretty sure that Shoyotani got internal brace surgery, which is what Drew Rasmussen got. It's what Glass now got. It's kind of um, the preferred option, seems to me, more and more. If you uh, don't have like a full tear, if it's uh, if there's a certain grade of tear, you can internal brace is basically they. Um, it's almost like. Uh, pins like my 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 mom broke her her wrist recently and they put in two pins and two plates i think um ouch first of all but it's yeah. like that for ligaments like they they basically put in a brace inside your body um and uh the recovery time is lesser and um you know i i've been trying to poke around and find out about uh success rates um but from what I gather, at least the same uh, or as good as Tommy John. The reason I bring this up is because you might want to look at Bryce Harper and say, well, Bryce Harper wasn't himself even on the field when he came back. But I just checked to make sure Bryce Harper had full Tommy John. And this it's a significant difference because full Tommy John for pitchers has like a 12 to 14 month uh, time frame full uh, and internal brace for pitchers is more six to eight. That's a big difference. So if you think about that in terms of uh, players, position players, position players can come back from Tommy John uh, six to eight. If it's internal brace is any shorter than that, then you feel like, you know, Shohei should be able to get in the box and be hitting and feel pretty good by the time um, the season starts. Right. I wonder how much being a DH as opposed to having a defensive position expedites the recovery and the rehab and the things you have to do. I think Trevor Story is among the position players that went the internal brace route, but he's a middle infielder and he was trying to come back as middle infielder. He has to actually be able to throw. So that just changes everything quite a bit. Looking at what's been happening more recently, the last seven days, I think the ADP is about pick 13 for Shohei Otani. So a late first rounder in 15 team leagues. He was my first round pick in the draft and hold that we wrapped up uh, over the weekend. The range is like pick 10 to pick 20. Are you in at the later part of the range at full price? Or is this one of those situations where you say, Otani's wonderful, but why would I expose my roster to so much risk when there are so many other great players available in that range? Yeah, I have to a certain extent. I had this problem with Aaron judge 
um, as an early pick, which is there's a fair amount of injury risk associated with him. Um, with uh, Otani, it's interesting. He's been on the field. So as a hitter, you could say, I think he's going to put up 600 plate appearances. And worst case scenario, it's 35 homers, 10 stolen bases, and like a 275, like basically 2020, 2022. And that's not going to necessarily be as good as a, as a 13th pick, but it's a pretty good floor. And I do think that's the floor. I don't, I don't know. I think in terms of hitting, he's been out there hitting a lot. And I think he can be out there hitting. The question for me is just, is he going to hit those top end max EVs? Is he going to, you know, have the same bail rights right off the bat? We saw with Bryce Harper a little bit of a of a uh, slowdown, even when he was, you know, playing but not on the field and was a DH. Uh, it took him a little while to kind of get to that power stroke. So it, it, there is. Um, I would like to either pair him with somebody who has less risk. Um, you know, if I'm going to go two bats there, um, but if I have to go Otani Burns. Um, as like the beginning of my uh, my draft, I feel like that's loading up on risk, isn't it? For the first two picks, like you don't know what can happen there. Team could name itself. I mean, it could be it could be frustrating if it ends up being a slightly longer recovery window, or more likely if that performance does slip. I I see this three year window where Otani's barrel rate's like nineteen percent over the last three seasons, which is just yeah. absurd. His first three years here, it was closer to about twelve percent. So he has just made some massive strides as a hitter just yeah. in the last three seasons. The other thing that I think kind of keeps things afloat, consider that on a per game basis, his run and RBI total should be as good as they've been at any point in his career because this will be the best lineup he's ever played in by far, right? With the move to the Dodgers, with the people around him. So even if he loses time, I think that floor is surprisingly high. He's one of the few players I would consider taking in a situation like this in the late part of round one. I completely understand if you just don't want to do it. And I agree with you that you would generally want someone that you think is a low risk, which would probably lead to a longer conversation on a future episode about Joran Alvarez because I paired Alvarez with Otani. I think some that people seems... say he's got questionable you leaned for a young guy. The, the injury risk. <laughs> I played that draft a little more like I was just shooting for the overall. I started taking a little more risk in there where it was like, well, you know, it's it's either going to crash and burn and be a lot of fun or it's going to go straight to the moon. And it's going to be fun because it did that. One, so. one note about the team context uh, before we move on is just that, um, you know, if you're using steamer projections, the auction calculator to put punch out of value, you're going to get a really good number for Otani, but that's going to be on 676 plate appearances. I'm not super comfortable with that. Uh, ATC has him down at 619. That feels better. Uh, even, even at that projection, they say 38 homers, you know, 278 average and tons of runs on RBI, as you mentioned. Uh, but with uh, the Dodgers being as loaded as they are, they can give Otani days off. Uh, they can slow roll, you know, his uh, rehab if they need to. So I'm just not sure he's going to get to 676. Yeah, future dollars or not, you know, you commit $700 million to someone, you're probably going to be a little careful with them coming off of an injury and their season starts earlier than everybody else's because of the two-game series against the Padres in Korea. So I, I think if what if he starts on the IO, oh, I wonder what happens. So if Otani plays in that series and then we've got drafts after that, does he shoot up a half a round? Does he become a mid first rounder mm -hmm. the last week in the draft because he was ahead of schedule and playing in the later part of and March? you get and like I, you have to check with your provider. Like, do you get those stats retroactively if you draft him? I think most most providers are going to count those. That's how it's been at least up up until this point. So two games, two homers from Otani, and you know you can bank those two homers, and he's healthy, and you you take him fifth. Yeah, yeah, he gets up all the way up to the top five if uh, it plays <laughs> out like that. But uh, he's not the only relevant UT-only player, and your league rules will dictate whether some of these guys actually qualify somewhere else. We're using the NFBC requirements of 20 games played at a position the previous season. So the second tier uh, is all outside the top 100 overall. It includes Marcelo Zuna, J.D. Martinez, uh, Loy Jimenez, and Byron Buxton. And the more you look at these guys, the more similar they are in terms of their their profiles as hitters. You've got Martinez as the guy with the 
longest track record, but he's also the oldest. So there's some health risk. He's also still looking for a team. Um, you look at Eloy and you say he hasn't done it all with all of his skills over a full season yet. But if you Frankenstein the low K rates with the power flashes and, and say, let's give him 140 plus games, then you can see a guy that should be more of an early round pick uh, with Buxton. You see a player who is a completely different guy than when he entered the league. And there is a massive, massive playing time question with him. Plus the twins insist that he's going to play in the outfield again this year, which is more for me, like a thing I'd like to see, but it's more of a, I'll believe it when I see it. And you're talking about a guy that hasn't topped 500 plate appearances since like 2017. So it's a, it's a really tough investment. Ozuna in addition to a suspension for violating the league's domestic violence policy, got off to a miserable slow start last season and was underperforming prior to that. So it looked like he was on his way off the roster for a multitude of reasons. And he comes back and hits 40 homers and looks like a middle of the order fixture on one of the best lineups in the league. So it's a goofy group of players because you see up and down performances. You see a surprising amount of durability concerns, especially with the two younger guys on the list with Jimenez and Buxton. These guys should be relatively healthy compared to the likes of Martinez. I guess as a player, I prefer Ozuna just because he's under contract. He's got a role at 33. You could, you could see another healthy season in there. The bad ball data was good, and even if it regresses, it'll regress to career norms. Um, so he should still have a, a, a barrel rate of you know, 12 13%. Um, what concerns me about J.D. Martinez, other than the age, is that the strikeout rate uh, seems to – what he seems to be doing is trading um, contact for power and, and doing it in a way – it reminds me of Joey Votto was doing it a little bit um, near the end um, where like in order to get that contact point out in front, in order to hit the ball hard, he's just, you know, committing earlier, swinging earlier and uh, missing more. So you had the worst whiff rate of his career, the worst strikeout rate of his career. And I don't think he's going to like the projections, 28%, like he could do that or he could do worse. Uh, so I think that, the batting average is a little bit soft. It's not going to be terrible, but it's a little bit soft. And I just, you know, I don't know what to project him for uh, playing time-wise. 450 plate appearances. I mean, the team that he signs with will tell us a lot about how much he's going to play. Right. But I would also look at Martinez and say, almost certainly the team context gets worse than it was last year. He's leaving the Dodgers. And but that might mean more playing time. A path to more playing time, but also the per game runs and RBIs are coming down. Mm -hmm. And he already lags a little bit and runs because he's not a good runner. Right. So that could get really weird. He could be a kind of a funky player, especially if the average falls apart. Steamer has him at 248. ATC's got him at 257. So there's probably some other projections we haven't seen yet. They're going to come in a little higher than ATC. So yeah. it's a choose your own adventure. Like, what do you think JD Martinez really is at this stage? I'm. I'm probably holding off. I think of these four, I still fall into the Eloy trap. I just <laughs> I, help me. I, I can't because I, can't I was going to say, myself. I'm going to fall into the Buxton trap. Like I, I the, the reason that I'm going to fall into the Buxton trap over all these guys is I just feel like with all these guys, you're kind of looking for the best case scenario. <laughs> right? Like you're like, like how, how far can the price drop? And how high is the upside? I think you want to take these guys in a place where if it doesn't work out, you drop them. You know what I mean? Like the more you have to depend on these guys, the more I would maybe gravitate towards JD Martinez, you know, but the, I always think that these people would be drafted with an eye for upside. So I'm going to take Buxton because you know, even the way that he's projected, it's like 25 home runs and 10 steals in, in 400 plate appearances. So like, what could he do if he got 500, 550, you know, like I, I'm just going to go back to that. I mean, I don't think Eloy's that much better. I think the categorical potential for Buxton is more intriguing. Yeah. I just cannot figure out how a guy, I mean, it's obviously the types of batted balls he hits. 
and the fact that the K rate's been up over 30% now in back-to-back seasons. I'm so surprised that he's a low Babbitt player given his speed and given how hard he can hit the ball. It just doesn't quite make sense to me. I don't know. I, I understand why you like Buxton. I'm not the I'm not an I'm not like an anti Byron Buxton person. Some people are just like he's never the, Buxton. I've been burned too many times. Fifty percent fly ball guy. So those are the reason is that Bab is low is is probably pop flies. Yeah, it must must be that. But Eloy, I'm going to say one more time. I'm I'm in. I think it's going to work. I think it's going to be average run production and power. Obviously, no speed. Buxton could do it with a low average. Be a thirty ten guy for you at a very low price. So some intriguing players in the group for sure. The late, late options here, this is a group that spans from Joey Manessis down to Jonathan Aranda, largely a group of players you'd be thinking about for NFBC purposes, 15-plus team mixed leagues, uh, draft and hold, mono leagues, of course. I am wondering if there's anybody in this cluster that you think could actually emerge to be more shallow league relevant because it's not a bad group of players. Manessis... I'm pretty willing to write off. I mean, he got a full season's worth of plate appearances last year for the Nats. He's a great story, but the power fell off completely. Like the glimpses of power he showed when he debuted in 2022, those were pretty much gone last year. He's an old guy on a team that's, you know, trying to move towards the future. Um, You know, he's he's an easy guy for, you know, James Wood or Dylan Cruz to kind of swim move right past. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that the chance that he's the starter all season is, is fairly low actually for me. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not interested, but what was the other, uh, what was the other names on this, on this part? It's kind of a group of either recent or even current prospects. Heston Kerstad, Mark Vientos, Tyler Soderstrom, even Jonathan Aranda, Harold Ramirez is way down there. If you're just looking for mono league purposes, but the other four. You can start to make a case for any one of them. Kerstad, if Mountcastle plays less, which we talked about him on the first base preview, he just doesn't get back from a disappointing 2023 season, there's a path. If an outfielder gets hurt, there's a path. If Ryan O'Hearn doesn't maintain the gains he showed us in 2023, there's a path. When Kerstad did play late in the year when the Orioles called him up, it was more in the outfield than at first base. So I think there's a little more flexibility for him. He should pick up in-season flexi- in-season eligibility relatively quickly once he's on the roster if he doesn't get option triple a to start the year so i do think Kerstad has a shot at becoming more shallow league relevant depending on how things break this spring yeah and you know i like people rightly bring out the age at 24 he was old for some of his levels and that takes the shine off of some of his good wrc pluses plus in 2022 in high a he was below average that's it's not something you normally see from an elite prospect but i was really impressed with him scouting wise at the afl i thought he had two or three different things he could do at the plate you know wasn't all pull power it was spray the ball around a little bit make contact um you know have good plate appearances and also hit the ball hard to the pull side so i i kind of like that there seemed to be a couple different skill sets in there and then uh from a number of scouting standpoint uh in 2023 he had a a hard hit rate above 40% at AAA combined with the big leagues uh, and a max EV of 113.5. So I believe in the power. Um, I don't know if he, how much how much he's going to give you steals wise, but um, if say Mount Castle uh, does not uh, sort of get the gears turning again the right way after those injuries, um, you know I do think that there's a, a chance for for Heston at first, and then also the outfield is a little bit less crowded than the infield so uh heston is somebody I, I i could take a shot on but not again not if i have to depend on him more of like a draft and hold third first baseman or something um not something where i i guess in like a 12 team you could put him on your bench and then drop him in spring once they assign him to triple a or whatever you know what i mean like you know w- sort of a stash and watch but um I think that probably if we're talking about someone making the opening day roster that has some prospect shine and is in this group, it's probably Tyler Soderstrom. Um, One thing I don't like about Soderstrom's package is that he, uh, I don't, I shouldn't, 
I shouldn't go around commenting on men's packages, but uh, you know, is that uh, Skill he's set. got <laughs> he's got a low walk rate. So yes, the the strikeout rate is high, but I I would kind of rather he almost took the Ryan Noda approach where he's like, you know, I'm going to keep my OBPs high. I'm going to have a high walk rate, but I'm going to smash everything that is in my smash zone. Um, and so I just wonder if this aggressiveness, the lack of walks, um, is part of why he was so bad uh, in his first 138 uh, major league prayer appearances. But if he sort of regresses to his abilities, he should at least hit the ball hard. Uh, I don't know if it's going to create a good OBP. I don't know if it's going to be usable in a lot of ton of leagues. Um, but you used him in a really interesting use case. Um, which uh, serves as almost a, a bridge to the other part of this episode. Um, him and uh, ha- Harry uh, Henry Davis. Mm-hmm. Him, and, him and Henry Davis are uh, provide you an opportunity in some leagues, if you're in a two-catcher league, uh, to draft a util-only guy uh, that will play at catcher eventually and should get catcher eligibility soonish into the season. Um, and that's a way to draft a third catcher that could play as a second catcher uh, and cost you the same as a fourth catcher. Congratulations. <laughs> hey, you know what? At least you're doing it with a player that has some prospect appeal. I mean, the fan graphs. I like great Davis a power. little better. I like Davis. I think Davis just has a much safer floor. The performances throughout his time in the minors around a wrist injury, among other absences, like Davis looked like really a really good, good player. Yeah. Um, I think Davis has to catch more because of, of the Andy Rodriguez injury. So whether that was the plan for the Pirates or not, it looks like they're going to let him at least play there enough to qualify. The other difference for me, Davis qualifies as an outfielder going into the season. So you can at least use uh, him as like a fifth outfielder in a deeper mixed league. I think he hits enough to be a useful fifth outfielder in a deeper league anyway. But He strikes out less than Soderstrom and did at every level. Uh, he hits the ball hard-ish, uh, not as hard as Soderstrom. So that's, I guess, some of the question mark plus the the angle. He hits a few grounders. But I could see this being sort of a, a, a line drivey type thing where the batting average is a little better than you expect for a catcher considering that um, he can Henry Davis can run a little bit. Uh, but we are, uh, I guess I thought he was util only. So with Soderstrom, uh, I'm somewhat interested. You played that uh, interestingly as a, as a way to get your third catcher. Um, I could see that kind of a use case. Um, the other package of players um, that's included in this in some leagues are players that were out for the season last year. So just a quick nod uh, towards Gavin Lux and uh, Reese Hoskins who um, Gavin Lux will get uh, middle infield eligibility really quickly. I wonder, uh, is there some chance that Reese Hoskins ends up being util only this year, Uh, just coming off an injury the way he is and depending on who signs him and who they have to play first base. Um, So uh, Hoskins deserves a mention and I'm, uh, I'm into him. I I know we've talked about him a little bit uh, as a first baseman. Um, I, I would uh, I would buy this season. I don't think it's like Tommy John for pitchers where you'd rather take him the year after they come back. You know what I mean? Um, I think he can come back and hit the ball hard and you know see the ball hit the ball. Like I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm not respecting an ACL tear enough, but uh, mm. I would sort of expect him to step right into where he'd been before. I think a lot of it's timing. Both Hoskins and Lux got hurt early relative to the, you know, the baseball calendar happened in spring training for both of them. So they've had a longer window to kind of fully do the rehab and then to maybe transition back toward things they would ordinarily get to do to prepare for a season. I mean, I mean they yeah, were talking I, about Hoskins coming back in the play, in the playoffs if if they went long enough. So yeah, I, I think it, it's quirky to me that you would lose eligibility because you were hurt. Like, there's a there's a few wrinkles in the rules I don't like. I understand the rules are written the way they are. I understand how yeah, to apply the rules. Yeah, should just be grandfathered in. Like if you where, where you played the year before should be where you're still eligible. Yeah. But even like the Soderstrom one, he 
he played a position in the field more than he DH, but because he split time between catcher and first base, he had more games at DH than either of those two positions individually, and therefore doesn't qualify at catcher or first base in the NFL. And not and not twenty for any of them or something. Yeah, it was like eighteen, so 15, 15, 10. 10. Oh god. So <laughs> defensive positions more than DH when you add them up. That should be a rule that like triggers the. Okay, well, which position did he play more? Okay, he's a catcher only, or he's a first base only based on which one of those two he played more. Like, yeah, we, if he played the field more than he did DH, it's weird for him to end up as a DH. That's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. But I'll, I'll end the rant there. Any interest in Jonathan Ronda? Do you believe the Rays will actually play him? Because I feel like this is an annual... <laughs> an annual hey, is Jonathan Ronda going to play this year? Is he going to get traded? And all he keeps doing is lifting the ball more at AAA, putting up ridiculous numbers, he doesn't have a lot of defensive value, but if he's going to play, if they're going to put a glove on him, he's going to play on the right side of the infield, probably first or second. So maybe he gets some chances to pick up in-season eligibility with lower thresholds. But do you think the Rays will trust him enough to put him on the big side of a platoon and see what the bat can do? Man, it's so funny. Just looking at what he did last year, 230, 340, 368. Uh, may surprise people that Jonathan Rondo was above league average with the stick last year. Um, steamer projections to be 15% better than league average with the stick, but only gives them 196 plate appearances. I mean, I, I kind of feel like if both those things are true, both those things can't be true. If he's going to be 15% better than league average, they're going to find a way to put him on the field. He plays a There's, lot if he's 15% better than league average. He may even get like a regular spot. I mean, fifteen yeah. percent. the The traditional platoon split is ten percent off of that. You know, so if he's at fifty fifteen percent over, he'd still be around league average or slightly better against same handed. So, um, but we do this every year, where we're you know we look at the the Rays depth chart and try to figure out who's the who are the winners and losers. I, I will say that there's been some rumors that they're going to trade Harold Ramirez. And that's still in play. I mean, we still have a fair amount of free agents out there. We still have a fair amount of time till pitchers and catchers report. If the rumor is they're going to trade uh, Harold Ramirez, part of that might be for recent acquisition, Richie Palacios and Johnny DeLuca, but they also have the in-house Aranda and Caminero. So um, what happens when we build a bench really quickly? Our brains break because there are way too many players there. I know, but let's put Caballero uh, in the starting position. We go Paredes, Caminero, Low. Is he low or Lau? He's Lau. Brandon is the Lau. <laughs> Paredes, Caminero, Lau, Yandy Diaz, uh, Renee, uh, Renee Pinto, Rob Brantley is part is bench one number one. Yep. Taylor Walls is bench number two. He's hurt, so it might have to be Basabe in the Walls spot, but it's one of those two, right? Oh, was there news about walls? I thought I saw something. What so, like some some combination. So I think there's if Caballero's the starter and Walls is hurt, the Walls is on the IL, Basabe is the backup shortstop. If Walls is healthy, maybe Walls is the starter, Caballero's oh, the backup, and Basabe is a triple A. Because of his hip, that he's unlikely to be ready for opening day. So okay, let's just Caballero. Uh Caballero is the starter, Basabe is the utility, uh the but you always have to have a backup shortstop. And so yep. I don't think Caminero is the backup shortstop. So Basabe makes the team. So Basabe and Brantley are, are parts one and two of the bench. You go a Rosarena, Siri, Low, um, Harold Ramirez across the outfield. Bench number three is Richie Palacios. Yeah, it's funny. Roster Resource has him. He has one more starting option. DH. Yeah, it's, but they have, okay, they have so three let's... platoons. They have, they have effectively three platoons between. Basabe, DeLuca, and Ramirez, and then you have Lau, Lowe, and Palacios all coming out of the lineup. I mean, that's so we that's, you basically that's have very a, much a guess. You have a four man bench, right? So the four man yep. bench is Brantley, Basabe, Palacios, and one more spot. So it's probably DeLuca. Right. And that means options. that would, that would leave Aranda on the but... outside looking in as it's currently built. So Aranda has to beat out DeLuca or Palacios. And and DeLuca is a righty, so I don't think that's actually... He may have to beat out Palacios. Palacios is a lefty and has one option left. So Ronda has to beat out Palacios. Palacios has a 107 steamer projection bat-wise, but also has probably more uh, value in the field. And um, 
fits the team better. Like I think they would rather have another outfielder than another infielder. Yep. But this also means that Caminero might not make the team. Yeah, but you have you have to like pull back in this. We'll probably get it again in detail on the Rays preview. How many of these guys are good enough to block Caminero? How many of these guys are good enough to block anybody who performs well? Like they're so right. DeLuca has an option, Palacios has an option, Aranda has an option. It's like yeah. You know, if Caminero plays well, then okay, time to use those options. Right. The only players who actually don't have options left, the catcher and, and on the backup catcher, Brantley, if they keep him, Harold Ramirez, Lau and Rosarena are, are in. So, right. and, and low. So, Siri and Paredes don't have options, but Caballero, Pinto, Palacios, you know, Basabe, DeLuca, they all have options. Yeah. This is on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and it drives us nuts. Uh, I think Aranda is uh, a final infielder in a draft and hold. And a, I would rather have him in a bench in AL only. How about Mark Vientos? Last UT we'll talk about. Does he hit enough to play a lot? He's a righty. They've got DJ Stewart around as a possible lefty that could share some time at DH. Alvarez you know, is their regular catcher. We'll talk about him a little bit later in the episode. Is I think Beatty, even though neither one of these guys is a good defender, there's a much better chance that Beatty is a passable defender at third than yeah. Vientos is, and Beatty's a lefty as well. So I just look at Vientos and say he's got to mash and just be the DH. Otherwise, there's just not enough playing time for him. Yeah, I think there's some team context where he could get a larger uh, slice of the playing time pie later in the season. So it sort of depends on how they play. Like in a weird way, betting on Mark Vientos's playing time is betting against the Mets to be good. <laughs> right? Because the better they are, the more they're going to prioritize now than the future. The worse they are, the more they're going to be like, okay, let's use this time to see if Vientos and Beatty. Beatty is like at least good enough where you can be the opening day third baseman, even if they want to be good is how I feel. Whereas Vientos, I think there's such a, a question mark about how good he is because he hits the ball hard. He does hit the ball hard. 114.9 max EV is really good. 51% hard hit is really good. 31% strikeout rate at 24 years old. It doesn't scream that it's going to get a lot better, especially with the whiff rates he puts up. So it puts a lot of pressure on him hitting the ball hard when he does hit. And that can look really bad in a small sample. So they start running him out there. You know, and he's hitting 150, you know, for a couple of weeks because he's just missing a lot, you know. So I, I think that Vientos is maybe someone you try to pick up um, early in the, in the season if the Mets are doing poorly. Because I just I, I think maybe to begin the season, I don't know that he has like a full time role. I'm going to watch very closely this spring and in the early weeks and be ready to pounce as a, an April pickup because the raw power is legit. And the playing time, the play. playing time in spring is also important. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll we'll get a better feel for this one. As play with the starters. Closer. Does he play with the starters? How like you could even just do a playing time sort uh, for the Mets in spring and just look for plate appearances among the Mets in spring. If he's one of the top four or five guys, I think that they're looking at him to start the season. I would say be careful about expecting a lot based on the improved K percentage at AAA last year. Again, ABS system did some goofy things to strike out rates. So the key is going to be a high swing and miss guy, even though he can do a lot of damage. If, uh, if the sticks and gets a lot of run, let's shift the focus to some catchers. We <laughs> do you prefer single catcher leagues or two catcher leagues? I prefer single catcher leagues because they're barely good enough to play in one catcher leagues. <laughs> rude uh, <laughs> but the the great catcher revolution is uh, underway there's a lot of good young catchers so maybe it'll get a little better i'm with you though I, I actually even though i think every league i play in uses two catchers i don't like it i wish they were single catcher leagues with those two ut spots uh, I, I but i also like 15 team leagues a 15 team single catcher league gets reasonably deep into the pool and you still have to play it correctly i think a 10 team league I have nothing against shallow leagues. A 10-team league with one catcher, I understand some of the arguments against that where it's like, well, anybody gets 
a catcher that's useful in a 10 team single catcher league for the most mm-hmm. part because if you're wrong there's someone useful on the wire so because yeah. that's for me the pool's like 12 maybe 14 the quality catchers deep in a any good year and this looks like a good year tier one starts with adley rutschman who's the only catcher kind of flirting with a top 50 adp sort of fluctuates right on that borderline so i lumped in everybody inside the top 100 to tier one that's rutschman jt real mudo will smith william Contreras, and yiner diaz <laughs> yiner diaz has been to me the most surprising catcher adp of this entire winter so far but we're going to start at the very top with rutschman I just want to know, like, do you see a world in which Rutschman gets even better? Be that with a better batting average because the plate skills are so good. Do you see him possibly tapping into a little more power because the zone judgment is really good? The barrel rates have been good, not amazing so far. So maybe he could just add a little bit of power now that he's got more big league experience under his belt. Like, I don't know. Like, I think he has to do something to keep this spot atop the group. Because some of the other guys that are getting drafted behind him have shown us higher ceilings, especially in the power department already. Yeah, I think a, a little bit loftier of a swing uh, might be somewhat helpful. I mean, he he went into the home run derby uh, and had some memorable moments um, and then hit even fewer fly balls in the second half. So 33% fly ball rate for Adley Rutschman, you know. I think if he just nudged that forward, you could start to see that bail rate get close to 10% because he obviously has the max power. And um, I love his walk strikeout rate, uh, you know, pairing there. So um, I'm not going to not take him because of the barrel rate. I'm just going to say, you know, this guy is a switch hitter at 25. There's a lot of ways for this to go right. And the, and the worst case scenario is just another year with 270, 20 homers. That's a much better batting average than you're going to get from most of your catcher situations. Only other part about Rutschman's profile that is even remotely questionable is how they used him with 110 games behind the plate and like 46 as a DH. As they get more crowded on that roster, I wonder if they're willing to DH him less and catch him more, especially as a team that's going to have, I think, perennial or just DH him less to keep him fresh, you know? Right. Yeah. Does the playing time go down a little bit? That's 687 plate appearances for a catcher eligible player is unbelievably rare. So you have to just keep that in mind. We've had a couple catchers do it, but I think the team context seems different. Like Salvador Perez is a guy who, you know, ran some really high uh, plate appearance numbers. I think he might have paid the, the piper on that a little bit. You know, some of these some of these injuries he's had um, near the end of his career. Um, and it's also just uh, the Kansas City Royals are just a different team than the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, these Orioles seem to have you go three deep at every position. I could see them start to be much more of a mix and, ma- mix and match. Keep all your guys healthy. Um, you know, the rarer, uh, you know, situation is like the Braves where they run everybody out all the time. But if you think about it, they didn't do that at catcher. No, not even with Sean Murphy. And, yeah. and I think you could justify using Murphy more than they did last year, which will be uh, coming up here in just a couple of minutes. But that workload, you think of JT Real Muto as a heavy workload catcher because he is. JT Real Muto has never gone over 600 in a regular season before. <laughs> and Rutschman yeah. was flirting with 700 last year. So I and think that's he, something that you have to be really mindful of. He's got a top five projection, top six projection. Uh, Real Muto does at 492 plate appearances. I'd argue that, you know, the error bar skews above that. Uh, that 492 is a, a pretty good um, sort of uh, conservative projection for his plate appearance totals. And I think just interesting that by steamer, he's worth like, you know, $10 to the eight to $10 less than the guys he's than the guys he's sandwiching in between by ADP, Adley, Adley Rutschman and, and William Contreras. Mm. The reason that I think he belongs there is that I'm worried about the plate appearance projections for Adley Rutschman and William Contreras. Both those guys are projected for 630 plate appearances, and it's just not something you see a lot from catchers. Now, if you're talking about Milwaukee versus Baltimore, there is a difference, which is that Milwaukee is desperate for offense. 
and may not be likely to sign William Contreras to a long-term deal. So like, maybe they're just like, hey, while he's here, while he's young, we need his offense pretty desperately. We're going to find a way to get, you know, 600, 650 plate appearances out of him. It's certainly possible. They also are more likely, even though they've got a lot of outfielders, I think they're more likely to have that soft playing time available at DH than the Orioles are. So they can mm-hmm. keep Contreras' bat in the lineup, you know, catch Eric Haas or Austin Nola or whoever the backup catcher is. They have another young catcher coming, Jefferson Caro, maybe by the end of the season, more likely in 2025. So this, you could be right about the, let's just blow out the playing time for one more year and then maybe we're trading Contreras or we're able to just back off him as a catcher a little bit in the future because we have someone else we really like on the roster too. Uh, Will Smith sort of gets like lost in here, and I like Will Smith a lot. And we talked about it with Otani up top. I mean, every game he plays, the setup is as good as it gets. He's going to be 29 in March. The barrel rate fell last year for the first time in four seasons under 10% by a healthy margin too. So I don't really know what to make of that. Uh, I think he's not a batting average liability like a lot of the catchers that go in the second and third tier. And the counting stats should be fantastic even if the playing time stays exactly where it is for Will Smith. I don't really see a lot changing in the way things are set up for him because the Dodgers seemingly are just keep content to have Austin Barnes hanging around as that backup catcher again. Yeah, I just wanted to say I finally uh, figured out who I think Will Smith looks like. <laughs> oh, after all this time. After all this time. And I, you're going to be like, who? His name is Will Poulter. And he was the warlock in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. <laughs> yeah, anyway. this is a deep cut. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought he'd played uh, someone young. Um, that kind of Will Smith looks kind of young. Maybe it's his Maze Runner. He was in the, in the, in a couple of the Maze Runners, so maybe that was the role that I was thinking of, where uh, <laughs> he looks like a young kid. Anyway, uh, Will Smith, perpetually young, uh, looks great. Uh, looks great on paper. Uh, I don't know why the barrel rate dipped last year, um, but I have got no complaints. And I think, you know, when you look at the rest of uh, the catcher pool. Like he's just such a metronome. Like Real Moto's older, you know. Do you believe the Rutschman and Contreras con- projections? You know, I believe a 520 plate appearance projection for Will Smith. I believe the $20 uh, number that spits out. Um, so it's um, it's oat. It's not oatmeal. It's it's. There's got to be. We got to have like an upmarket oatmeal, which is like just steel solid. cutouts. Steel cutouts. <laughs> restaurant like oatmeal to me. Restaurant oatmeal. <laughs> Organic oatmeal. Yeah. I, I don't I know. I mean, it's it's it, it, it. There's just it's hard to analyze and 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 you know put a put a spin on it. It's just like he's good and he deserves to go where he goes in two catcher leagues. And if you can, if if somehow wait and get him after as the fourth catcher, I feel like that's amazing. And and if there is, uh, I guess there's a tier for me. Those top four catchers are, I think, above and away clearly the top four catchers, and uh, there is a separation with the next tier. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I I can't quite understand why everyone's so confident that Yiner Diaz will just take what he did for a partial season and expand on it because there are some questions we're going to raise here in a minute. I think as I look at the big four, because you pay that extra tax for Rutschman, the alternatives, we always say, what can you get instead around pick 50? That's still where elite closers are available. That's still where you get some possible SP1s, depending on how you feel about guys like Tyler Glass now. I'm more in on the alternatives that I am on Rutschman. If Rutschman fell a round or two, I have no problem taking him there. But that opportunity cost is just too great where he's going right now. I think of the other three, there's not much that separates them. I think Real Mudo maybe had a, because of the extra workload of the long postseason in 2022, I wonder if he was just a little more fatigued in 2023. Age is a factor here. You wonder if the stolen bases are going to dry up, but still 16 for 21 last year. I don't think the sprint speed's really gone down that much. I think I would give the edge to Real Mudo over Contreras and Smith, but there's very little that separates those three beyond Real Mudo's ability to contribute on the base paths. Yeah, it's just it's interesting that Real Mudo is uh, 
like a more like of a top seven or eight guy um, by Steamer. Uh, I don't. I, I guess um, I think it's average two. Yeah, two fifty five. But I, I just I feel like uh, this is it's mostly a playing time gamut. Once you like put the projections in front of you and you look at these, you're like, oh, okay, six hundred and thirty three plate appearances, Rutschman twenty four dollars, six hundred and thirty plate appearances for Contreras twenty seven dollars. Uh, even when you get to uh, Salvador Perez, who is in the next tier, it says twenty three dollars for him and five hundred and eighty plate appearances which maybe, you know, so there's a lot of like the, the higher the plate appearance projection is um, the more value there is. And that's a duh, but it also means, do you believe it? You know, do you believe the 630 for those other guys? I believe 490 for, for, uh, for Contreras. So I, I mean, for real Mudo. And in fact, he's beaten that uh, all three past years. So I, my personal production would probably be something like 525, 530. We'll talk about Yiner Diaz now, even though I think he fits somewhere in the middle of Tier 2. Uh, you were looking before the show. You got this uh, chart if you're watching on YouTube. It's a pitch location map. And <laughs> the things about Yiner Diaz that are really interesting, mostly it's that he seems like he's able to hit pretty much anything. He's a free swinger, and he gets away with it. 23 homers in 377 plate appearances last year. Kept the K rate under 20%. A uh, really low walk rate, 2.9%. That's low even for someone who's pretty aggressive. The hard hit rate, barrel rate, it's good. Hits the ball in the air. This is good. I think I mentioned it during the postseason. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out that y- why Yiner Diaz didn't get a chance to pinch hit when John Singleton did in a key spot in the postseason <laughs> for the Astros. I wonder how much, much of the... much concern about handedness. Yeah, I, and, and the thing was, he ran a reverse split last year. He crushed righties. So I don't know if that didn't matter to them or I I don't know. It's an unsolved mystery for me. But what do you think happens with his playing time? Because they made the managerial change. So Dusty Baker's gone. If it was a Dusty thing, that's no longer a problem. If it was a Martin Maldonado handles the staff exceptionally well, so we'd trust him more, he's gone. So it's basically Yiner Diaz and now Victor Caratini as the two catchers on the depth chart. Do you think Yiner Diaz plays enough to make people happy who are taking him as the fifth catcher off the board. I think so. I, I'm not so concerned with the playing time. Uh, Caratini is a long-term backup and I don't think that he has the same um, uh, reputation for defense that like a Martin Maldonado does, you know, like I haven't seen a, 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 the kind of puff pieces we get about Martin Maldonado's defense about Victor Caratini. Uh, what I am concerned about is a little bit of uh, overexposure to somebody who's, you know, uh, did well in, in a smaller sample. The reason I have this pitch location map up is in September, Yanir Diaz struck out 30% of the time. And I'm not suggesting that he will strike out 30% of the time, but this made me want to look up where he was being pitched. And if you're looking at this pitch location map on YouTube, like Diaz, that, that red stuff at the top, that was new. That's what that was new in September. So this is locations against him in September. And that whole red stuff across the top is new. So it seems to me like the teams are in the process of developing a new book on him, you know, of figuring, figuring him out. And the, what makes me nervous. And I, and I did take him um, in the eighth round and ahead of Sean Murphy, which pains me a little bit. And ahead of Cal Raleigh, um, I don't know exactly why I did that. I think um, I was thinking about batting average for some reason. I don't think it was one of my best picks. Um, you know, Salvador Perez went after him. Sean Murphy, uh, Logan O'Hop. I mean, I think I think I should have. I, I think I was like concerned with getting a, a top five, top six ish first catcher, um, and so I went with that. But I think I could have just taken two middle catchers and been better off in any case what i'm worried about is the strikeout rate surging because teams have figured out a different way to pitch him and if you look at yanner diaz's just regular line of results it is a little weird to have a 14.7 percent swing strike rate for diaz against a 19.6 percent strikeout rate it almost feels like like those two things can't coincide always and so i wonder if we're going to see a little bit more traditional catcher outcomes with like a 25% strikeout rate and a 250 average. Although I will fall back on the bad ball quality being really good. 
Yeah, uh, I, I think he could be a 30 homer catcher, even with 450 plate appearances. That's yeah. very exciting. And he may be able to hit 260 or 270, even if the OBP is not very good. All of those things are possible. Plus, you get the Astro supporting cast for your, your runs and your RBI. So it, it can work. I just think there's a little more risk here that I'd like to take because I think the second tier is really solid. I think we're finally seeing some aging in Salvador Perez, or we're seeing the wear and tear of heavy, heavy catching workloads and overall playing time workloads for his career. Still going to be a big part of their plan. Still going to be solid. Uh, I think the guy going right next to him, Cal Raleigh, is going to give you a similar roto performance. Raleigh's glove is so valuable. The Mariners are going to play him a ton. So I do think you get that extra nudge in playing time. and He's a little bit younger, so you're not younger than Perez, of course, who isn't. But you're not really worried about the playing time falling off just yet. They don't have a lot to really push him behind the plate anyway in Seattle. Sean this Murphy is going to be a bad batting average for Raleigh, and you know the strikeout rate is pretty bad. So yeah, like I I just don't see anything in his profile that says he's a better hitter, like a bat to ball hitter, than he is to this point. But it this is fine. It's like a thirty ish home run catcher that does you do, really well. It's it is a little bit worse than like it is like a twenty point hit in batting average among these um, in this group, and so you know if. It, it, it's like he's going to be a better fit than uh, for some teams than others. Right. If you kept yeah. your batting average high, but you kept it at the expense of maybe some power, then he's a great pick. Uh, but if your batting average is a little bit more, you know, iffy uh, based on what you took, I I would prefer Wilson Contreras or, or Salvador Perez over him. You do have to think about the the weight of the plate appearances with the low average player. Like a low average power catcher is pretty common, but the guys that play 150 plate appearances less aren't dragging that category down as much for you even though you get more counting stats the extra playing time you have to keep that in mind as far as how much it's actually going to hurt you you take a a number two catcher that hits 230 plays less okay well that's fine that's not you almost want to budget yourself for your second if you're gonna have to have two catchers that your second catcher is gonna hit 230 so Mm -hmm. when you're making your team like you kind of want to make sure that you already have at least one or two guys are gonna hit like 290 just to make up for your catcher hitting 230, your second catcher hitting 230. If you if you have uh, Cal Raleigh also hitting 230, then you you want those two guys to hit 300, not 280. You know, like you're going to have to have some batting average to offset that sink. So this you're, cluster, you're targeting a 260 batting average, basically. You know, 257, 260. That's what you're looking for in most leagues. Maybe in 10 and 12 teams, leagues is even higher. So. That's why you have to think about, you know, putting a 225 on your on your on your roster. This cluster of catchers lives in the pick 100 to 150 range. Sean Murphy's in here. Gabriel Moreno's in here. Francisco Alvarez is in here. And Wilson Contreras is in here. I look at this group, especially Murphy and Contreras in particular. What are what's holding people back from looking at those guys as just really strong values? Murphy in particular, the workload was lighter than what he saw in Oakland, but the counting stats actually improved because Atlanta's offense was so good. On top of that, Travis Darno is going to be 35 in February, and he had an 83 WRC plus last year, so they could very easily play Darno less this year and give Murphy another 50 to 75 plate appearances without overworking him, but that would also give him a chance to leapfrog a couple of these guys that are being drafted ahead of him because you could add another 10 to 15 run score in RBIs. Yeah, Wilson Contreras and Sean Murphy ended up 8th and ninth last year um, among catchers, and um, that's sort of where they're slotted now, so I think that's a that's a buying opportunity. Um, I think they both they have this kind of you know, team context that, you know, Wilson Contreras playing in the outfield and everyone hating on his defense. And like, what does that mean for his playing time going forward? Uh, Sean Murphy has the worst projection of the group with a 404 plate appearance projection. Um, And yet last year with 438 plate appearances, he was still the ninth best catcher. Uh, So I I think that the, basically people are looking at team context, maybe a little bit too hard. Just look at the player. The player plays well. Uh, He's going to play. Wilson Contreras, even though everyone was, you know, ragging on his defense, like still played. He was still DHing and outfielding. So um I, I think these guys will play. 
Moreno is interesting to me. I I gave you a little bit of a, a chart for him um, because the one piece. So I made this these these conditional formatted things with uh, chase rate, zone swing, barrel, max EV, and hard hit. And uh, for Moreno, the biggest red his his barrel rate's not great, but his biggest red is his zone swing. Uh, he had the second worst zone swing rate. Um, you know, of the, t- of the kind of top 15 catchers. And w- with that kind of swing rate, you might not be surprised. The chart that I'm showing you is his zone swing rate against his WOBA, against his production. And they almost map on top of each other. <laughs> the more he swings in the zone, the better he is. And I feel like that's such an obvious correlation that his hitting coach will notice it. And it's an easy sell to Moreno to be like, Hey, next level for you with your great eye at the plate and your great ability to make contact is swing at more strikes. You know, um, and so I, I think that's an easy. Uh, he and he did it. He did swing over more uh, more strikes over the course of the season. So I think that's the source of your added upside uh, going forward. Is probably a slightly lower strikeout rate, even maybe even some more doubles power. Um, you know, a, a, a solid batting average that has become more valuable because he's making more contact and putting more balls out there. So I, I do think there's uh, Moreno has a little bit of upside uh, beyond his draft position, and and playing time wise may have the most upside um, of this group in terms of uh, plate appearances, raw plate appearances. May beat all of them except for Perez, who's just naughty that way. Well, yeah, the non-catching play playing time for Perez makes it a little bit unfair. But I, I yeah, I. I I definitely see he's only 24, 24 in February. I think you're getting Kibber Ruiz 2.0 at a minimum, but because he can hit the ball hard and because he has a good hit tool, like there's a chance Moreno does make some of those adjustments you described and, and takes the leap. And I think people seeing him on the big stage in October probably came away a little bit impressed with what he was doing in the playoffs as well. So I, I, I could see him getting a little bit of a bump here as we move through the next couple of months as well. Uh, Alvarez, some people wonder, is he Gary Sanchez as a hitter? I think the thing that really stands out to me is just that he's defensively been better than expected, right? The questions that were immediately apparent about Gary Sanchez as a catcher are not there with Alvarez. It seemed like he sort of ran out of gas as the season went along, but he hits the ball very hard. He always has enough raw power to pop 30 homers, even in that stadium. And if you said... You know, who's who could actually emerge to be the highest dollar earner of this entire group? Hmm. Alvarez could do it relatively unexpectedly because nobody here is going to be great in batting average other than maybe Moreno, most likely. Yeah. So if Alvarez gets up to 235 or 240 and does get to 30 homers this year, he could be the best of the bunch. He could be like Cal Raleigh with a better batting average. Yeah. Yeah, I think Cal Raleigh is a, is a, actually a pretty good spot to to part target him and and say that he can be that. One thing I'm impressed with is you know you've got we've had this long conversation about guys who have like you know high ish strikeout rates in the minors and then you know some of those guys turn out to be unconscionably bad in the major leagues in terms of strikeout rate and some of them don't and you know I saw this Francisco Alvarez 25 26 percent strikeout rate in the high minors and thought. You know, and I and I've read some stuff about you know there's a there's a hole in zone and he can't cover it and so I thought maybe he'd be a 35 percent guy in the major leagues and I've faded Alvarez. Uh, I think uh, I'm gonna take that fade label off because he struck out basically the same last year as he did in Triple A, um, and so uh, I don't know that he needs to have a 222 BABIP. It's not like he's super super slow. He, he is a catcher, but you know how how you know how how much Babbitt is good, is being super slow going to take off? It's not going to take off eighty points, you know. No. So uh, I feel like you know there's a possibility. Like two, you said two forty, two forty five. That's not always projected for it. Francisco Alvarez projected two thirty. Yeah, but I could I could see two forty coming from him and the power for sure. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting thing with the strikeout rate because the higher K rates were something people were worried about. He was very young for the level everywhere he played to. You had to kind of put that into context. Mm-hmm. You also wonder with a guy that has that much raw power, how were minor league pitchers trying to work it? Like maybe he was just getting non-competitive pitches a lot because of the damage he could do. And that can lead you to some kind of goofy strikeout and walk rates as well. But 
I think he just has a lot of things going right for him and is a core piece for that Mets team as they try and do this quick, quick rebuild. I think he's still going to be at, there next time. Look at really his, good. at his contact rates. You know, he's, 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 he loves the ball inside, uh, but he can also, he has something he can do with loan away. So he at least has two approaches. The hole that he's got is, is not high across the board. It's high and away. And I would just venture that, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard spot to hit for mm-hmm. pitchers. I mean, he could just decide not to swing at those pitches and probably do fine. Yeah, but a really nice group here. And this is kind of where your single catcher league guys run out. And you look at that and say, yeah, there's at least a good enough catcher for everybody in a 10-team league if we're going to go go that route. You start to get to more questions in Tier 3. And we're talking about picks 150 to 200 in a lot of NFBC leagues, but those are all two-catcher leagues. So these guys are firmly in play. I wonder if, if you're in a two-catcher league, are you waiting this long to get your first catcher, or have you at least gotten one from one of those first two tiers in most of your leagues? Well, that's that's sort of what happened with my Yanir Diaz pick was that, you know, I, I felt like I needed to get somebody at the top. And and looking back, I think that's a mistake. I think you can get value wherever. Um, and, you know, waiting on catcher like if i'd ended up i could have easily um uh, waited a little bit and ended up with moreno and ohapi that was a possibility in rounds 11 and 12 you yes. know and i have why not do that attack the middle i think attack in the middle is actually better than what i did which is take really early and really late so i ended up with your diaz and uh oh god patrick bailey with christian betancourt and christian vasquez behind him like I think I would much rather had Moreno, you know, Ohapi, and then maybe an early third, um, but um, that's not what I did. All right, so you could live with maybe one from the back part of tier two, one from tier three, and then one more from four or beyond, and say I got three, and I'm happy with that. This group includes Logan Ohapi, Bo Naylor, Jonah Heim, Kiber Ruiz, Mitch Garver. And Luis Campusano, a lot of guys that I like. This is kind of part of that younger catcher revolution. I think four of these guys are under 25. Ohapi had a labrum tear that took away a lot of his season, but he looked really good last year. Showed a slight yeah, propensity. He came back fine. Yeah, so yeah he, he chased a little. If you're just trying to find stuff you don't like, but a 15.6 percent barrel rate uh, just looks like a guy that's actually a, a fixture for them up the middle. Like, I, I think that's real. I think the playing time is going to be there in a high, high capacity too. So I think that's an area where you could see Logan Ohapi creep up and compete with some of the guys that are being drafted ahead of him is I don't really see much of all, at all to compete with him for playing time. This is a great tier. Like I, I wish we'd done this show before my next, uh, my next draft. I will draft from this tier. I feel like that's why you bought a three pack. Yeah. <laughs> Campusano. Uh, I like the, the contact rates, um, uh, re- but you know, but Campusano has, you know, you know, if they, if there's a guy that I would put up against uh, Logan Ohapi, it might be Luis Camposano uh, because really nice strikeout rates, not quite the same bat of ball oomph that Logan Ohapi has, but you know, eight percent barrel rate, one hundred eight, you know, one hundred seven six max EV. Like I could see him having like you know eighteen homer power and maybe the best batting average in this tier, other than Kevin Ruiz. So. You know, in Ruiz, Camposano, and Ohop, you kind of have like three catchers that are cheapish, that have uh, upside, that are young, and that also fit different builds. If you just need batting average, take Kevin Ruiz. If you need batting average a little bit more pop, take Camposano. If you just need power, take Ohop. You know, and that that gives you three different kind of cool use cases to come out of here. I think Jonah Hyde and Mitch Garver are the like you know, more veteran, you don't, you're not looking for upside as much as just, you know, guys who will play and uh, won't make your team worse. And they're just fine. You know, more oatmeal than, than those, uh, those three young catchers, the three young catchers have a little bit of excitement with them. Yeah. So I, I do think if you want to shop late at catcher, maybe you have to make sure you get three. I, I like to try to roster two. If I go early, just to have that extra bench spot to play with. I know if you lose somebody in the middle of the week, you're playing short. But I do think you might find more value in the extra roster spot in that kind of build. Ohapi plus Naylor plus one of the older guys that you know is going to play, I think makes a ton of sense because Naylor, Naylor can steal bases. Like this is kind of exciting. We have another guy with sort of a, 
a JT Real Mudo Roto profile where, where it could be at its peak five categories. I think with Naylor, we've seen less swing and miss as he's moved through. Even with the debut, 23% K rate, we'll take that all day from behind the plate. Tons of walks, decent barrel rate, good speed, five for five as a base dealer. I mean, if he's a 20 and 10 guy behind the plate, even with a little bit of short term downside in batting average, that's going to work all day. And the playing time situation looks a lot better. I think this time last year, they had brought in Mike Zanino to be the starter, and they kind of waited and waited and waited. Naylor's the guy now for the Guardians. So I think things look a lot different now. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not sure the projections have, have caught up to that 100% because they have him at 367 plate appearances, which keeps his value down compared to his peers in this section. Um, why not 450? I mean, that's like your sort of standard catcher uh, workload. So um, I think they'll they want the offense, and he can hit the ball hard. So they're you know they're going to play him, and also you know 50 percent fly balls last year for Bro Naylor. That's not he's had some higher fly ball rates, but he's he's I would say like for his minor league eyeballing it, it's probably around 45 percent, 40 percent fly balls for Bro Naylor. So I'm not worried that he has a super extreme uh, sort of uppercut swing that'll cost him in BABIP and strikeouts. Um, I think that'll that'll kind of uh, come down to earth and have an upward pressure on his batting average. So I do like Naylor in there. It, it, I like the idea, the idea also of pairing a Heim or Garver uh, with one of these young guys in, I, I don't know if, I guess he's in the next tier, uh, but I've got uh, uh, an interesting little tidbit here. You know, Tyler Stevenson, you know, young, it seems like he might uh, belong in this group. Uh, he goes later. He's projected a little bit worse. Uh, but he's projected similarly to some of these guys. Um, and he goes maybe 30 picks after Camposano. So there's a, there's a tier there, but I could, uh, I could see him producing. If you've got the, uh, that's it. Uh, this is the hard hit rate for September. And the reason I bring this up is that Tyler Stevenson had some pretty serious injury, uh, issues. And I think it just took him a while to come back. I think this is the Tyler Stevenson we saw in the minor leagues and that we saw coming up that, you know, could could hit the ball hard like this. You see, uh, if you're looking on YouTube, you got William Contreras first, Will Smith second, JT Romino third, and hard hit rate in September. Tyler Stevenson, Logan O'Hoppy, uh, fourth and fifth, Francisco Alvarez. Um, and uh, then you've got your, you end up with Jan Gomes and Jonah Heim at the bottom. But uh, I just think it's interesting. O'Hoppy, the same thing where like, you know, as the season progressed, he got going. And I, I think that has to do with coming back from injury and, and figuring out the injury component, just feeling better after a while. So um, I think Tyler Stevenson is, you know, you could expand the group of youngsters that you might want to pair with a, a Heimer Garver uh, to include Tyler Stevenson. Yeah, I think Stevenson deserves to be in this group. And he's not that far. He's the first one in tier four, like right after pick 200. So his ADP could jump up a little bit as people get more and more comfortable with how his playing time will look. And if you take the early career strikeout rates with the current power and the improving lineup around him, very easy to see a big leap this year from Tyler Stevenson. So that's a, a great call. And it's nice to see those, those September numbers. And a hoppy again, I can't emphasize this enough, coming off of a labrum surgery too, doing mm-hmm. that is really impressive. Garver doesn't have to catch really at all in Seattle since he's there and, and Cal Raleigh's the main catcher. So this is basically a chance for Mitch Garver to be a DH, which could open up 450, 500 plate appearances, at least as a possibility. Health is a part of the reason why Garver hasn't been able to catch more in the past. But if he gets the 500 plate appearances, this is big time power. This is 25 to 30 home run power with pretty good swing decisions to boot. It's just so weird how his barrel rate has oscillated from really good to ish, good ish. And I'm, and I'm worried that, you know, last year was one of the good ones. So when we're getting one of the bad ones, this is very scientific by the way, uh, because every it's, it's every other yearism. Um, but no, I, I'm also just worried about any player that, um, has to encounter playing at home in Seattle for the first time. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not good for hitters. And, um, I think I'd rather have Jonah Heim. Who's just in the same position he was before. I like, I like that better. 
I like Kiebert Ruiz a bit where he's going to, if only because playing time looks super safe. The one longer term question will be, where does he hit in this lineup once they start bringing more of the prospects up? You probably see some some drop there, but I don't think that's going to happen until the second half of 2024 at the earliest. A little bit of a barrel rate improvement last year from Ruiz. Not ridiculous, but we've always kind of wondered like how much power he was going to get to for a guy that has really good bat to ball. I think Steamer is pointing to a, a 270 batting average for him this year, which would be a career best. And the extra bags that Ruiz chipped in in 2022, those actually went away, but he's still young enough where you could still see a few steals from him. So I think there's I think there's a lot of safety in playing time with these young catchers because they've demonstrated that they're the number one catcher and you know the the bar for playing time for a catcher is pretty low. So like I, I don't know that you even need to do the thing where you combine it with Hyman Garver for to make sure about the plate appearances. I think Caper Ruiz is gonna clear four hundred and seventy five plate appearances. I think Logan O'Hoppy is gonna clear that. I think Bo Naylor is going to clear that. I think Luis Camposano is going to clear that if he's healthy. He's got a little bit of a, a health bug there. I think Tyler Stevenson is going to clear that. So I, I I think just take two of your favorite young guys out of this tier. Yeah, I think the, the other variable for Luis Camposano that I feel like I have no read on is Ethan Salas. Like, he shouldn't <laughs> debut this year, but I, I can't rule anything out as far as how the Padres have handled him so the far. The Padres have two, two aces in the hole. It's very strange, you know. Mm -hmm. super super young shortstop and super super young catcher <laughs> yeah you just don't quite know like what they're thinking as far as how aggressive they want to be in those instances uh, moving on to tier four tyler stevenson heads up the group this includes elias diaz uh shay langoliers ryan jeffers and then both blue jays catchers danny jansen and alejandro kirk it's kind of interesting that kirk was on that hard hit leaderboard for september though because his underlying quality of contact metrics took a big tumble jansen's had this sort of two-year run where he's looked like a better hitter than i used to give him credit for yeah and those two guys have to sort of jockey for the playing time behind the plate and then get a little bit of whatever is still available at dh based on how the rest of the roster looks they're going pretty cheap so i could see a case for you know taking a flyer on one of those guys as your second catcher maybe even as your third if you're doing the weight at catcher game that we just talked about a little bit earlier um, do you trust what you saw from kirk at the end of the season enough to believe that some of the previous ceiling is actually still there. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I'm a little worried that we're getting the, the uh, Vladimir Guerrero uh, looks lovely in projections every year and is just okay in actual real life situation. <laughs> Cause he, I could see why he, the projections like him, you know, a guy who, walks 10% of the time and strikes out 10% of the time and has, you know, 108, 110 max EV. That's like he checks the boxes for a nice batting average, a good OBP and enough slugging to, you know, give you this 120 WRC plus. But really, he's only cleared that 120 WRC plus he's projected for once in 2022. Um, and the other two seasons, he was more closer to average. I, 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 I don't know if this is a hot take or a dumb one or if I'm making a mistake here, but I kind of want to not take part in this. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Take. I think we just talked about a bunch of players that have considerably less concerns about how much they're going to play and have exactly. similarly interesting skills. Even if the, it's not the same skills as Kirk, like why, why walk into a situation that could turn into 350 plate appearances when some of the other guys in this tier should play more? Like, yeah, I'm not a big Elias Diaz guy because he's 33. The park is kind of a big part of his he's value. An all -star, dude. Yeah, he's an all star <laughs> dude. Nice roster Rockies. <laughs> Shea Langoliers, I think, could be he's the all star game MVP. Wasn't he? <laughs> Did he get the MVP? I think I he got the he winning hit. <laughs> oh, well, good for him. I mean, like good for uh, him. <laughs> like, it, it's it, that's that's a cool story, but. Just as far as like trusting those skills, look at his year to year variance as a both a real oh, life yeah. player and as a hitter. It's remarkable. Shea Langoliers is the, if I'm not really worried about average and I want lots of power and lots of playing time from this group and someone else gets me on Stevenson, I think I would take Langoliers for now. If something changes with the Twins and Christian Vasquez gets traded to a team that needs more help at catcher, then Ryan Jeffers jumps up quite a bit for me from this group too so there's still pretty good skills in tier four outside of the top 200 but i'm really looking at langoliers and then stevenson 
with Stevenson having a pretty healthy floor above him as the two that I really like from this group. Elias Diaz, 2021, 13th best catcher uh, in 371 plate appearances because he hit 18 homers. <laughs> and then 2022, people have said, okay, you know, and I did this too. I- I'm taking him. And he was the 24th best catcher uh, for fantasy. Uh, and then last year, when you say, well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not taking that guy again. He's old and he was 24th best catcher last year. And he was the 12th best catcher in 2023. Well, so that's a little bit of that oscillation you're saying. It also, though, points to what is the risk and reward scenario here? I am risking uh, a nothing pick. Uh, 24th best catcher is not going to help you. I'm risking nothing. Uh, I, I'm risking a, a big deal, uh, the, uh, like this being worth nothing. And what I might get is the 12th best catcher. <laughs> it's just, I don't know what the risk and reward there. Um, Ryan Jeffers is someone that I think is starting to take uh, the playing time share. If you look around at some of the different depth charts on Fangraphs, you'll notice uh, 50-50s uh, on some catching situations. I feel like those are ripe for making a decision. Which one do you like better? Um, and to me, Ryan Jeffers has the batted ball quality that I'm looking for uh, that that Christian Vasquez doesn't have. And Jeffers has uh, cut his strikeout rate, you know, a little bit since he's gotten more regular playing time. So I think he could hit 250 with 18 homers, 20 homers. I mean, there's, I think there's some playing time upside there where he gets to 450 plate appearances and, and, you know, gets that 20, 22 homers. And I think that's probably a little bit more of a reward uh, for your risks down here. Yeah, I would say Jeffers would qualify as my last acceptable catcher too if I was really trying to wait at the position because I do like all those things you mentioned. The, the, the barrel rate, every year he's been in the big leagues has been double digits. And with the K rate going in the right direction, you could see that maybe tick up a little bit with more playing time. Sometimes you get these part-time guys that are in the, the best possible spot. They show that skills growth. They go to a larger role. K rate kind of goes back the wrong direction. Okay, fine. So if he hits 230 at this price, but he gets to 20 homers because he played more pretty good runs and RBIs sign me up. I'll, I'll definitely take that in this range. If you want to go to the great beyond <laughs> pick 300 and beyond at catcher, you're going from Austin Wells down to like Freddie Fermin and even places lower than that. If you really want to, uh, I'm going to make this really open ended. If you waited for a long time, or if you're looking for a bargain, kind of backup catcher, your third catcher on your roster for a 15-team league. Who do you like going late in drafts right now? Uh, I picked Patrick Bailey uh, in this league. He's projected to be uh, basically uh, replacement level. Um, And uh, so, you know, top 30. Um, I, I liked him because he was super, super cheap. I rated a really long time. Um, but, uh, also I I just think this defense will keep him on the field. Uh, I don't know. I've seen a lot of Patrick Bailey. He's maybe, you know, him and real Muto are the two best, uh, guys against the run, you know, from my sort of scouting standpoint, I'm not looking at a leaderboard right now. Um, but I also just like that, you know, I had 10% bail rate and he had a 28% strikeout rate, but he's a switch hitter. Uh, and he's 24. I just feel like that strikeout rate is going to go down to meet, you know, some of the numbers he had in the minors. And uh, so just a little bit of incremental improvement in strikeout rate and fly ball rate and the kind of things you'd expect from a young catcher uh, who's a switch hitter. I also just like he's going to get the platoon advantage every time he steps to the plate. Um, so, you know, these are small things. Uh, but when you're shopping in this group, uh, small things you like or is what you're looking for. Um, like Nick Fortes doesn't really have anything on the field that I can point to that I can say, I, I like this about this guy. Uh, but Nick Fortes, when they did the bat speed, uh, you know, measurement had plus plus bat speed and a 19% strikeout rate. So maybe he could, uh, put that together somehow. So these are the kind of things you're looking for when you're when you're just sort of grasp. This is the grasping at straws uh, tier, I would say. Yeah, I like Miguel Amaya uh, as if it might be shared with Jan Gomes. I think that's the the only real concern. But I think if you've got two catchers you feel good about playing time wise, and you want your third to be someone that could take a pretty big leap because the skills look good, 
Amaya's that guy. And it's not going to cost you much. 9.7% barrel rate in his debut. Big offensive numbers during his time in their system. Had some injuries that cost him considerable time as well. I think that's maybe kept him from getting a lot of hype. But he could be the guy. Jan Gomes is old. Jan Gomes is almost as old as me. And that's not good. Even though still hits the ball hard. Still has a little bit he can offer. I think he's kind of trending into that more likely to be a backup because he's he's 36. Man, like how much could you rely on a 36-year-old catcher? Uh, yeah. Austin Wells is kind of interesting because he's with the Yankees, but I don't know if they like him enough as a catcher to let him be the regular starter, right? I mean, Jose Trevino. Trevino has had some good runs. I think that'll be a 50-50 that actually sort of stays 50-50. Yeah, Wells being a lefty at least could be on the big side of a platoon if they do it based on matchups like that, but they've got Ben Rortfit there. I I don't know. I just... I can't get a good read on how much they really like Wells defensively, even though as a hitter, there's plenty to like there. Uh, I actually mm-hmm. thought Freddie Fermin was a little more interesting as a hitter than I would have expected. I thought he was a little more of like an org guy, but he'd shown some flashes. He's one of those players, if you look at his minor league stops, he'd get to a level and struggle and repeat the level and get a lot better. So I don't know. I always look at that as a, kind of a slight positive where you, you get there and it, you, you figure it out eventually. And I think with... Perez catching less in Kansas City. Freddie Fermin could actually pick up a lot of playing time. That's more for mono leagues, though, than for mixed leagues. I don't really know if I'd want him in a 15-team mixed league. He's even my third catcher. I think I'd rather wait a little bit longer. Uh, I'm wondering if the Red Sox are going to use Kyle Teal behind the plate this year because Connor Wong, you know, is just a guy. Reese McGuire doesn't hit that much. And even though Teal was, I think, the 14th overall pick last summer, he finished the season at double A. Our friend James Anderson over at Rotowire, I think, wrote his player outlook, and it's pretty optimistic about his chances of at least getting to the big leagues by the end of the season. But that's a pretty big area of need for a Red Sox team that, while they're not spending the way we're accustomed to, they're also probably not giving up on the season either. Yeah, I just... Until I see a guy getting regular playing time, I don't necessarily believe it because catcher is just one of those things where the team ask so much out of the catcher, ask them to do so much in terms of preparing for the pitchers, preparing for the defense, preparing as a hitter, that I think it just takes some time. And and that's borne out in the numbers. The catchers have the uh, latest debut age on average among the different positions. Um, so I just, I'm not going to have that many shares of Kyle Teal and redraft leagues this year um, because I just don't know how much playing time it'll, he'll get. But uh, one of the uh, more veteran guys, he's 27, and he did uh, play 105 plate appearances last year in the major leagues, and he showed up on that September hard hit list, and nobody thinks he's any good. Rene Pinto. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's atop the depth oh, yeah. chart for the Rays, and they don't really have anybody you look at and say, well, there's his competition. There's someone who's going to play a lot. So that's yeah. like a, an open door as far as uh, opportunity goes. And none of the projection systems really have caught up on that. Although you'll see Steamer says 381 for Rene Pinto and the Frank F's just start say 429, which is, they say, no, we see what, what Derek is talking about. <laughs> this is, this is their catcher. Uh, the projection isn't good. It's like a 86 WRC plus with a 33, 30% strikeout rate. But I just keep looking at that hard hit rate, 15 percent barrels in that month uh one 111 max ev 48 percent hard hit rate in the in in the minors and triple a so i think he hits the ball hard uh and i think they like him because they're like he's a guy who hits the ball hard and you know we like him defensively and and you know we're just gonna play him so pinto is not the worst you know sometimes when you're looking for a third catcher in a draft and hold you just want a guy who plays you know i think i think that that could could also go ahead no, it could be a guy who plays, yeah. I, I think that also applies to Jake Rogers, at least for now, with the Tigers. I mean, I think we saw it last year. 365 plate appearances, 21 homers. Batting average probably isn't going to be good, so you're you're taking a big hit there. But that power looks real. 12% barrel rate, doesn't chase a lot of pitches outside the zone. Uh, competition is a little tougher, I guess, if you believe that Carson Kelly could have a bounce back. I mean, it wasn't that long ago we thought Carson Kelly was at least a useful starting catcher, so... Maybe Kelly pushes him, and eventually Dylan Dingler could be the the young catcher that comes in the organization that that takes over. But yeah, that looking, is a name, Dingler. Yeah, <laughs> that, that actually seems like it's right out of Letter Kenny. 
<laughs> there's there's got to be a character named Dingler on there. Um, uh, not yet. I haven't got all the way to the end, but I have not been introduced <laughs> to a character named Dingler. Uh, it's hard to say you don't like somebody down here. Uh, you know, Gary Sanchez is a free agent, and uh, if he signed, I think he'd be a, a perfectly acceptable uh, third catcher, except you'd want to know where he signed, because if he signs to be a backup, that's a little bit, you know, he's not going to get that playing time. Uh, Yasmani Grandal is a free agent. His projection is is decent. I just, I did this thing where I looked at MLB trade rumors at the buzz around him. Zero. None. <laughs> there are no. no, there is no buzz. There is no, like, these teams are interested. And that makes me worried that, like, maybe actually the next announcement is retirement. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to, I don't want to have a retired catcher on my squad. Um, the uh, last one um, that I'm a little bit negative on is Blake Sable. I like that he has the dual eligibility. What I don't like is that the Giants just went and got Cooper Hummel, who has the same skill set as Blake Sable. And why did they nurse Blake Sable through the season last year? Because he was a Rule 5 guy, and now they own Blake Sable. So now they can they have three option years on Blake Sable. So they can option Blake Sable. This is the dumbest game. This is the dumbest game. They're stockpiling assets, right? So you you now you option uh, 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 Blake Sable, and he becomes your 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 Triple A backup catcher, which is he's probably the best Triple A backup catcher in baseball, maybe. You know, congratulations, you guys, you did that. Now you do Cooper Hummel and you play the game all over again. Ah, makes me tired in my soul a little bit. Kerry <laughs> Sanchez uh, actually had a better season at the play that people probably realized last year. Is a two seventeen average? Fine, the average hasn't been there for the better part of five years. But the nineteen homers. 19 yeah. homers and 267 plate appearances. That's good enough to at least be a backup somewhere at a yeah. minimum. There's, there's some teams that don't have a catcher, at least at, at a glance. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So uh, he'll find a job somewhere. Um, I also, be surprised if Grandal did too, but I would rather hear that news before I drafted him. I'm just, you know, I'm a little bit bummed that the White Sox were the team that brought in Martin Maldonado because I actually wanted to see what Corey Lee would do with playing time and Max Stassi. Oh, I want to see what Max Stassi does with playing yeah, time. I want both then, those guys to play. It's a crowd. It's a crowd. It's I'm, a crowd because of Maldonado, but then you have to also remember, like, they're not the Astros. They don't have to play Maldonado the same way the Astros did. He's 37. Right. Why do they have three Yeah, catchers? he could just be a, a mentor. Corey Lee has an option, uh, and right. Max Stassi doesn't. So my bet is Stassi is the quote-unquote backup to Maldonado. But yes, why do that um if stassi's playing well if stassi you know so stassi has has had a, a kind of a rough year personally had some uh, stuff he was dealing with at home and i think that was uh partially what happened in 2022 because if you look at 21 uh and 20 for max stassi uh, he hit the ball harder uh he had better barrel rates uh just sort of better seasons overall i could see hit you know 2022 and missing all of 23 as being related to these uh family uh health issues that he was dealing with um and so if you give him a, a if you just if you erase 2022 off of this uh i think his projection would be uh, better than it is um and you could be looking at a guy who could hit 240 with you know 15 homers if he starts playing to that projection then i think they just you know they back up Maldonado off and say, we're, we're we found our new catcher. Uh, if he doesn't, then, you know, it's a total miss and uh, Corey Lee replaces him at some point or replaces Maldonado and they just go full rebuild. Maybe I'm giving the White Sox way too much credit, but perhaps the idea of bringing Maldonado in is to see how he might fit as a possible coach someday, right? I, <laughs> he's such an amazing catcher. Like maybe you could make Martin Maldonado um, your version of Charlie Green. We talk about the Brewers making catchers better all the time. And Victor Caratini, who's nowhere even near the rundown, got a lot better defensively, at least by the catch-all defensive gradings on, on fan graphs during his time in Milwaukee. Because that's just, that's something they've got in the organization. Charlie Green's been doing that for a long time. I could see Maldonado being that kind of player. As far as Stassi goes, you got to play Stassi over Maldonado. And Lee having an option, yeah, they could bump him to AAA for a little while. But you got to see what Lee can do too. You're a rebuilding team play the younger guys and 
see what you've got uh, in the organization for the future. Uh, the story on The Athletic from Sam Blum on Max Stassi and his family, it's uh, it, it's a tearjerker, but it's fantastic. So you should definitely check that out if you have a subscription. If you don't have a subscription, theathletic.com slash rates and barrels will get you on $2 a month for the first year. Uh, we did it. We made it through UTs and catchers in one episode, and it's about the same length as the other previews. So I feel like we've done somewhat well today. <laughs> we did some work today. <laughs> we did some work today. It doesn't smell like soup, even though it's time for it to smell like soup in my house. And now I'm worried that it doesn't smell like soup. I got to go make sure everyone and everything <laughs> is on schedule the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> like, where's the soup smell? What's going on down there? I'm going back to my litter kinney. Uh, uh, marathon session. I'm, I'm, oh, man. I'm going to, I'm going to finish season two today, probably. Uh, and writing tons of player caps this year. The play, my pitcher rankings will have capsules for at least the first 75, uh, pitchers, which I think will help people understand why I, I put a person where I put them. Get this guy a puppers. We uh, are going to go. On our way out the door, quick reminder, we've got he more said, They said in a recent episode, they were like, you know they don't have all dress down there? And they don't have vinegar on the tables? And then one of them goes, do they even have running water in America? <laughs> yeah, that was that's a great bit. They even get running water down there? <laughs> it's just the, it's the writing on that show that comes through in a lot of uh, a lot of different episodes. So glad glad you're enjoying it so far. Yeah, it's great. Uh, more, it's, a, more. it's a good departure from all the uh, survivalist shows I was watching. I'm mean, getting tired of of watching you know naked and afraid and all those you know mosquito bited up asses out there. So this is a, this is a good change. <laughs> great great sell job on the on those shows i haven't, haven't <laughs> dipped my toe into that genre but uh the mosquito bit asses uh, are keeping me yes. away even longer so thank you for, for that Pretty visual <laughs> uh, we got a 3-0 show coming out on tuesday position previews resume on wednesday so tuesday's a great day to binge on any previews you may have missed last week so with that we are back with you on wednesday thanks for listening